Welcome to this new episode of The Context. My name is David Orban, and today I am going to talk to you about our way of thinking and how are we getting help in thinking better and achieving our goals. Help that comes from many different, even possibly unexpected sources. We are very, very convinced of what we are and who we are, or even that we are. This uh, illusion, uh, if we want to call that, it's a story that we tell ourselves in order to maintain uh, a, an identity that can resist to more or less ferocious attacks from the outside world. Our identity in our physical bodies is uh, well perceived. Uh, the boundaries of our physical bodies represented by our skin enables us to, to see the difference between what is our body and what is not our body very clearly. But even there, um, we are living under the illusion that this uh, difference is uh, very um, abrupt and, and uh, it is actually possible to say that what is inside our bodies is us and what is outside of our bodies is not us. However, we know that is not the case. Uh, we are hosts to uh, a very large number of uh, bacteria, actually a large number of species of uh, bacteria, and uh, even every cell of ours is itself uh, a symbiosis of different kinds of uh, living components. Uh, the bacteria that uh, are part of our bodies help us in most cases. And sometimes when we fall ill, uh, they don't help, but they uh, provoke various kinds of illnesses from which hopefully we can recover thanks to our immune system. That is the way that we maintain this illusion of the coherent self. So could it be the case that the way that we think our consciousness itself is made of parts that are not only contained in our cranium, not only contained in our brain, parts that most of the time are useful, sometimes they are harmful, and of course, as we understand that, we can try and support the beneficial parts and keep the harmful parts under control. The ancient Greeks thought that thinking happened in the heart. Anatomy since then was able to establish that indeed a lot, maybe most of our thinking happens instead in our brain. This started with studying um, freaky incidents that damaged the brain and we could come to the conclusion that a healthy and complete brain was able to perform the functions that we associated with uh, healthy people completing the normal thought processes and when the brain was damaged. Uh, the first uh, studies were in the 19th uh, century with various types of mechanical injuries that left uh, the subjects of these studies alive, but with uh, um, very clear uh, mechanical damage uh, to, to their brain, well, we could draw certain scientific conclusions about the fact that thinking happened in the brain and that our consciousness formed in the brain. As it happens, we jumped ahead and kind of concluded that there was little more to understand. All our thinking would happen in the, happen in the brain and all our consciousness and decision making resided in the brain within our cranium. To the point where we would actually represent ourselves almost 
sitting in our brain, in our cranium. And there is a, a, an expression for this, for the little man, the homunculus, sitting behind our eye sockets. This predated uh, the 19th uh, century uh, experiments that uh, painted this positivist picture um, from a philosophical point of view where you reduce everything to first principles and there is no emergent phenomena that uh, disturb this uh, very radical conclusion. The homunculus is a very naive way of thinking about our thinking because obviously it entices a regression to an infinity of homunculi sitting in the eye sockets of the homunculi that are sitting in or behind your eye sockets. So it is not a very helpful um, metaphor or it is not a very helpful way of thinking about the way we think. Around the middle of uh, the 20th century, an alternative way of thinking about it emerged the theater of consciousness, where different um, participants contribute to the emergent phenomenon of what we call our self. And these different systems are called upon and then are racing to be the decision makers, depending on the circumstances. Uh, Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for describing what he calls System 1 and System 2 for different kinds of thinking, whether it is uh, abrupt, uh, reflexive, fast, or whether more meditative, more um, uh, reflective, and, and, and more analytic and slower. And we are trying to, of course, not only understand how uh, these systems interact and how these systems work together, we are also trying to deeply understand what we are, who we are, what are our responsibilities for things that we already did, or what are our aims and, and uh, abilities and opportunities for things that we want to do. Linking back to as basic philosophical assumptions as the existence of free will, which you don't very much find in physics. So a radical positivist materialistic thinking has a hard time understanding at what point this component becomes part of what we are and how we do the things that we do. And, and if it becomes part of our lives, uh, where does free will actually come from? I want to give you now as I usually do in the various episodes of the context, examples of what I am talking about so that you can understand that this is something rather concrete, not abstract, and draw your own conclusions of how to apply it in your own personal life or business life or how you think about uh, the way that uh, we uh, grow our societies, we organize um, uh, whether uh, a workplace or a village or a city or a nation and how we apply different technologies in, in what, we, what we do. So I am fat and uh, I have a very modern excuse for being fat. It's not because I am weak-willed. It is not because uh, I am... Uh, um, lazy and uh, don't work out, I blame my microbiome. Uh, when I see food, I stop using my brain and start thinking with my stomach. 
and uh, I stop applying healthy reasoning um, to understand the long-term consequences of eating just a little too much at every meal and slowly year after year putting on weight uh, pound after pound kilo after kilo um, and uh, I think with my stomach there are other people who uh, think with other body parts. Um, there are people who think with their penis. Um, if you are a teenage male, uh, the hormones that drive a lot of uh, your daily life uh, are going to influence a lot of your decision making, oftentimes very badly. In uh, 2011, the uh, Democratic congressman for New York resigned uh, because of sexting. And after he resigned, he was caught again a few years later sexting minors up to the point where he went to prison. And isn't it amazing? A person who is on the surface so accomplished, so um, well educated, so smart that he achieves uh, the political pinnacle of his career of being elected to the United States Congress is simultaneously so dumb that he cannot control his sexual pulsions and totally destroys his professional and personal life. A sculptor, if you ask her, oh my God, this clay sculpture you are creating in front of my eyes is beautiful. How can you... Um, come up with those shapes how is it possible that the model you are looking at uh, is taking shape in front of me in in such abstract but very evocative ways and very likely she will reply that she's not using her brain in order to analytically represent uh, the forms that her hands are shaping. She is thinking directly with her hands. A ballet dancer will think with her entire body. The translation of music into movement is not going to be mediated by the brain in her cranium. It is going to be represented by her muscles and her um, tendons and her years and years of training that enables her to do what she does. So through these examples, you understand that what we use for thinking, it is, is much more than not what is inside uh, our skulls. But does it stop with our physical bodies? There is a thing called proprioception. It is our ability, for example, to know where our hands are, where our legs are, uh, and uh, when our uh, uh, circulation uh, is constricted for some time, we lose proprioception. We, we don't know where our legs are anymore and we have a hard time walking or, or where our hands are. And, and we have to really work for a few minutes to restart blood uh, flooding and our nerves properly working in order to reestablish proprioception. It is quite amazing. And, and all of you who uh, have a driving license will confirm that proprioception extends beyond our bodies. We know uh, where the car's um, nose will 
B as we turn. A, a bus driver's proprioception will encompass the entire huge metal box that uh, is being driven around and a pilot will know where the wings of the airplane are as uh, it flies and as it turns. And decision making extends to the feedback systems that we incorporate in our consciousness. Um, as uh, we brake the car, as we um, yaw uh, the, uh, the airplane, we take into account the mechanisms through which we feed back the sensor information and integrate a perception of the self that incorporates these other systems. Our environment shapes how we think and who we are. Isn't it clear what an immense responsibility interaction designers have? Because whether we are talking about a kitchen that is ergonomic or an assembly line that doesn't lead to accidents because the strains on the backs of the workers are minimized, or whether we are talking about an app that is used by hundreds of millions of people, the people who are designing, implementing, observing and upgrading, making ever better performing these environments are shaping the behavior, the proprioception, the thinking, and ultimately the consciousness and the perception of the self of everybody. So as we are going to delegate the collection and the filtering of information into layers of abstraction that we can manage to artificial intelligence systems. And as we are going to go even further and we are going to delegate the design of environments in augmented reality and virtual reality to AI systems, as we are going to conduct our thinking through inputs, outputs, and decision-making support with artificial intelligences. Who will we become? Thank you for watching this latest episode of The Context. I really enjoy recording these on a weekly basis and I am very grateful for those who support this work. The symbolic sum of five dollars or actually the amount that you decide on Patreon is an expression of your feedback, your gratitude and of you being in a community with me of people who want to understand where our world is, where our world is heading, how technology shapes our reality, and how a humanity constantly evolving can thrive in the coming years. And so I am going to keep recording these with your help. And I'm looking forward to have you in the next episode of The Context.